Hello everyone, my name is Rylan Ridge. On behalf of our Science Cafe team, thank you all so much for coming to Science Cafe. Before I introduce tonight's program and speaker, I would like to take a moment to thank the OSU Office of Vice President of Research and the OSU Library for their sponsorship of Science Cafe OSU. I would also like to thank several student organizations who are partners of tonight's program. American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, College of Engineering, Architecture and Technology Student Council, Society of Manufacturing Engineers, and Society of Women Engineers. Tonight's Science Cafe OSU presents Into the Storm, Developing Drones for Severe Weather. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Jamie Jacob, the John Hendricks Chair and Professor in the School of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. He received his BS in Aerospace Engineering from the University of Oklahoma and his MS and PhD in Mechanical Engineering from the University of California at Berkeley. He was a National Re Research Council Summer Faculty Fellow in the Air Force Research Laboratory at WPAFB in both 2003 and 2004. Dr. Jacob has received multiple awards, including the OSU Regent Distinguished Teaching Award. Dr. Jacob is also the Director of the Unmanned System Research Institute at the Oklahoma State University. Dr. Jacob is the lead investigator for the NSF Cloud Map Project. CloudMap is an alliance of OSU, the University of Oklahoma, the University of Kentucky, and the University of Nebraska. CloudMap received from the National Science Foundation a $6 million grant to develop UAV systems to improve atmospheric research and weather forecasting and more accurate severe weather warnings. Tonight, Dr. Jacob's Science Cafe program, Into the Storm, Developing Drones for Severe Weather, will focus on the, fundament, the development and testing of unmanned aircraft systems for meteorological measurements within severe weather systems, including platform development, remote sensing, and the logistics of UAS storm chasing. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jacob. All right. Thank you, Riley. Uh, I appreciate that introduction. You were supposed to leave out the bachelor's degree from OU part. We usually don't like to mention that right here. So uh, yeah, I intend this to be fairly, you know, kind of an informal talk, so you know, um, if you have questions during the presentation, you know, please don't hesitate to, to kind of interrupt or we can wait till the end. Uh, as kind of Dr. Sewell was saying, kind of the, the nature uh, of the beast of talking in a library, library is everyone tends to be pretty quiet as you're talking about stuff. So hopefully we'll change that uh, mindset a little bit as we go through the, uh, the presentation. Uh, I would like to mention that we have many, many uh, contributors to this project. I'll thank some of them at the end of the presentation, but everything that you see in here is due to multiple researchers, not only from OSU, uh, which led this program, but also from other universities uh, as well. So this is Science Cafe, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is a little bit of science, and then we'll get back into kind of the exciting stuff of tornadoes, and that's what I'll focus on um, tonight. Uh, so first off, the Earth's atmospheric boundary layer. And what do we mean by that? Well, that's where we live, where people spend all of their time, but it's where also all of the weather that we interact with as people uh, forms and develops. And it's a very intricate phenomenon, you know, not only basis in uh, fluid mechanics, but thermodynamics, and also, of course, geophysical uh, fluid dynamics. Um, so there's a lot going on here. But the interesting thing about it, it's also really undersampled. There's much that we don't know about this particular layer. Weather balloons, for example, are great at looking at the upper layer aloft, not so great at taking measurements down in this bottom layer. Now, what we're really interested in is the formation primarily of thunderstorms, supercells that have the potential to eventually uh, become tornadic. What we want to do is to be able to take measurements in that so we can do a better job at forecasting and predicting what's going to happen. Most of our measurements take down or are taken down in this lower layer, very near the ground where we have things such as surface towers, where the mesonet operates. Um, you know, Oklahoma is blessed to have a, the, the best uh, atmospheric monitoring network within the world. Uh, through the development of the Oklahoma Mesonet, which was a joint OSU-OU uh, project. But still, it only looks at that very surface layer. Now, we do have things like weather balloons, 
Uh, but those provide very sparse or limited data within the atmospheric boundary layer. They travel through this region relatively quickly. So as you can see here by you know, the dashed lines, as you launch it, it moves up very fast. But we're also really limited in the amount of weather balloons that we launch on a daily basis. In Oklahoma, we launched two of these from the Oklahoma City area, one you know, near dawn, one near dusk, and that's the data that typically goes into our forecasting. Now, if we have something like a unmanned aircraft, and we'll talk about how these are being developed, we do have the ability first to not only get these back down, unlike a weather balloon, once you launch it and it goes off, you never get it back. With a UAV, we can send it up and bring it back so we have all of that instrumentation back with us. Meaning we can put better sensors on board, things that are more reliable and more accurate that provide us you know, a, a larger plethora of data. But we can also spend more time within this atmospheric boundary layer. Uh, really probing it or sounding it and getting more information. Now, what we currently do within this layer is we use these different tools. We have the weather towers and the weather balloons that I mentioned. We also have manned aircraft, and typically while we don't use those is because they're relatively expensive, and they're not great near the boundary layer because that's the region closest to the ground, and you want to avoid flying your aircraft close to the ground. You also don't want to fly these aircraft into severe storms. So we specifically steer manned aircraft away from severe storms, so that way we make sure we don't pose a risk to the passengers on board. With an unmanned aircraft, you know, that risk is mitigated by the fact that we no longer have people on board the aircraft. We also have radars, you know, which we tend to think as really the great modern tool that provides us all the information that we need, but we'll see why those don't work so hot and we also have uh, tethered balloons. Well, let's jump right into tornadoes. So this is the El Reno tornado from May 31st of 2013. Uh, and still to date, it is the location of the highest winds ever measured on Earth, around 300 miles per hour. Um, so that in itself is pretty remarkable that we have this F5 tornado uh, that was formed. Um, so massive, you know, that it essentially carved its own path through the earth, um, but also, you know, a really unique data point for us to want to try to go through the process of uh, analyzing and measuring. Now, how do we do that? Well, that's where storm chasers come in. And what you'll notice here are a couple of pictures, you know, first, uh, what happened to one of the storm chasers, and we actually lost three seasoned National Geographic storm chasers. Uh, within this uh, particular storm, primarily due to the fact that it was so large. And what you'll notice on the right side of this picture, uh, this is a storm chasing app, and every dot on that picture is a storm chaser or a storm chasing vehicle uh, converging on this F5 cyclone um, as it was developing. Now, what you'll notice is they're all kind of oriented in these north-south patterns following the, uh, the grid pattern of Oklahoma's roads. Um, but they're also preparing for the storm to take its initial path as it starts to develop off in the west and it's moving towards the southeast. However, this storm is so large that the size of it, the friction that it's creating with the earth, actually starts to change its path and it starts to move to the northeast. You know, much to the uh, surprise of the storm chasers, many of whom actually got caught in the path of this you know, very deadly uh, cyclone, which ended up taking uh, three lives of the storm chasers. Now, one thing you may ask yourself is, well, why do we need these storm chasers going into, you know, this really dangerous situation? You could say, you know, half of them are kind of yahoos that are interested in the thrill of the chase, but the other half are really seasoned meteorologists primarily interested in getting the data. Data that we don't now have about what's happening in and around these storms as they form. And the question is, well, why do we even need to be able to get data so close to a storm? Well, to illustrate that, let's look at some data from um, the last couple of decades of tornado warning time. And what you see on this plot, and I promise I think this is the only graph that I have uh, in the presentation, is you see uh, a couple of variables that we're plotting. The most important one of these, which is lead time, um, which is the green line. 
So that is the warning time that we're providing people on the ground that a tornado is going to be within your area within so many minutes. And you can see it starts off in the late 80s, around four minutes, and then it increases until we get around 10 to 12 minutes where it asymptotes for about a decade. And the reason for that increase was due to the development and introduction of Doppler radar into our forecasting system. And anyone in Oklahoma who watches any TV uh, during the you know, spring store season is very familiar with Doppler radar because every meteorologist touts their Doppler radar capabilities that you know, we have the best Doppler radar over any other um, weather station. Um, so it is a great improvement, but you also notice that not only does it asymptote, but it starts to decrease. So our uh, warning lead time actually gets worse about a decade ago. And that's because we actually got better at predicting or locating smaller tornadoes. And so those smaller tornadoes are harder to predict in terms of where they're going and how they're forming and how they're evolving over time. More importantly, what you'll notice with the red line, that's our false alarm rate, uh, which has remained incredibly high at around 108, sorry, around 80%. So that means out of eight out of 10 times um, that we report a tornado warning, eight of those times are gonna be false. So only 20% of those times are we accurate in predicting when a tornado is actually going to form. What that leads us to, from a psychological perspective, is as every native Oklahoman knows, is complacency. Oh, there's a tornado warning. Eh, you know, I'll wait until I actually hear the sirens or I see the tornado out my you know, back patio. Then I'll head to the tornado shelter. Uh, obviously, that's a, a big problem. And that, those are the two things that we really want to improve. Now, why does this gap exist? Well, first off, Doppler radar doesn't solve all the problems. One, it's a limitation of the horizon. Our Doppler radars in the state are primarily located in urban areas in Oklahoma City and Tulsa, meaning as you get farther away from those radars, they can't see over the horizon. Tornadoes, by their nature, are very low altitude phenomena that form very near the ground. So in that case, they don't see them, particularly here in Stillwater. You're you know, familiar with tornadoes forming no steel water. Typically, the meteorologists or the forecasters or weathermen on the news will say, well, there might be a tornado in still water. We're not quite sure. You know, if we're lucky enough that they're even you know, reporting the weather that's happening out in our region. If there's something interesting happening within the urban region, obviously they're gonna focus on that rather than focus on things happening outside the metropolitan uh, area. So that's obviously a large gap, is the ability to see these far away from the radar. Radars are also masked by precipitation. So the more precipitation that you have around a storm system, the less likely your radar is gonna be able to see that there's a tornado there. So you have a lot of scatter, and that results essentially in a blind spot within that tornado. So those are some of the limitations that we have with radar. It's great but it isn't the be all end all in terms of being able to measure or observe these storms and get the data that we need. Another example of why you know, we have a, a need for other measurement technologies or systems is what happened within the May 20th, 2013 uh, tornado uh, that developed just north of Newcastle and then progressed into the Norman and Moore area. This storm was there, even though it was happening in an urban area, was um, scantily observed by the storm chasers because they were all down south. Their forecast told them that the supercell to the south of the storm, uh, closer near the, uh, the Ardmore area, was the one that was more likely to form a tornado. That's what their predictions were telling them. That storm never developed a tornado. Meanwhile, this formed at exactly the same time. So there were only a couple of storm chasers within this area because it was the one that had the lower probability of actually forming a storm. Why? Well, we don't still, still don't know the answer to that question. We need more data to be able to give to the forecasters to actually develop uh, those models. This is what resulted from that storm. 
So you see that it essentially wiped out entire neighborhoods, not only removing all the houses, but also scouring things such as street signs and street numbers so that things were essentially unrecognizable. That I won't talk about here today. These are one of the areas that UAVs and other unmanned systems uh, can be used in the post-disaster scenario to go in and search for victims and be able to provide first responders additional situational awareness of what's actually going to happen. Let's go back to the physics part because that's kind of the, the piece that I want to focus on, which is how these systems are actually developing. So what you'll notice here in this graphic uh, is a supercell that's forming. And you can see that the supercell, which may extend up to 40,000 feet in the air, is much, much larger than the tornado that we have formed very near the ground, which may only be 1,000, 1,500 feet high. But as we have energy, warm air being sucked into the supercell, which is essentially charging this with immense amounts of energy, at the same time, we're having cold air being brought down from the higher elevations uh, that provides, again, a lot of moisture for the, uh, for the storm. So this provides this unique rotational capability uh, that forms the capability or the uh, availability for a tornado to actually develop from this rotation, which typically occurs in the horizontal area before it rotates 90 degrees and forms into a tornado that's facing down towards the ground. Those are the areas where we want to be able to get data from, which to this date, no one has been able to do. Now, <clears throat> this does beg the question, if we get additional data, is that going to allow us to be able to forecast using our mathematical models or provide the ability to predict tornadoes? So that's my cheesy graphic. Um, we do know that this is possible because we've seen this in other types of storm systems. Uh, what you'll see here is data provided by uh, Dr. Kelvin Drogemeyer um, from the uh, um, uh, University of Oklahoma looking at comparisons between forecasts as well as um, actual radar simulations. And what you'll notice is they're all different. Right? Here's a little tidbit about what happens on a uh, evening forecast when someone says, there's a 50% chance of rain. What that uh, actually indicates is from the weather forecaster is they ran 10 models. Five of those said it was gonna rain, five of those didn't say it was gonna rain. Which one of those is accurate? Well, they don't really know. So they say, well, our models tell us that 50% of the time they predict that it's going to rain. In reality, that means they don't really know. If you have you know, 100% chance of forecast, that means all the models are green. 0%, again, all the models are green. One that it's going to rain, the other that it's not going to rain. So most of our models have you know, things that they're good at and things that they're not so good at, but there's no perfect model that will predict the weather all of the time. What we do know, however, is we go through the process of comparing radar data and then feeding that back into the models that our models get better as we go through this process. So if we have the capability to take data, take that data in real time, feed it back to the model, our models only get better. So that's one of the things that we want to be able to do with the forecasting capability is provide data in real time, send that back to the National Weather Service so they can use that model to update um, their, uh, their data. Uh, now what you'll notice here is we do have a lot of other knowledge gaps. Um, let's see if I can get this video to play. So this is a uh, simulation of a uh, tornado, and so it does show that we do have the capability to predict uh, how tornadoes are going to form and model those in computational uh, fluid dynamic simulations. Uh, but we haven't been able to tie all that together to be able to predict when these are going to form in arbitrary conditions. And so we have to fill in a lot of these data gaps to be able to have a better understanding of how something like a supercell actually forms a tornado. Now, this idea has been around a long time and actually goes back to uh, a meteorologist uh, known as uh, Lewis Richardson, who had a quote that perhaps someday in the dim future, it will be possible to advance the computations faster than the weather advances and a cost less than the saving to mankind due to the information gained. But that is a dream. 
And it's about 100 years later where that dream now has started to become a reality where we have the computational horsepower and the mathematical models as well as the data to be able to put all of this together. And of course, some of the earliest weather computers, which would take up, you know, things uh, this size of this room, uh, were developed to go through the process of being able to predict what's happening um, in the weather. Now, what you'll notice here is an example of that capability, again, provided by um, Dr. Lee Worf of the uh, uh, SIMS. And so you can see using supercomputing uh, capabilities uh, with many thousands of hours of processing time, uh, they can now have a much better idea of what's happening at the overall uh, full scale of a tornado as it's sucking um, basically energy in, moving it up through the supercell and through that process uh, providing a uh, sustained capability of having that tornado migrate with the overall uh, supercell uh, itself. Well, this starts to lead us to the question then, well, what type of data do we want to get? What you'll notice here is uh, a radar image. This is what we typically see, and uh, those of us who've been in Oklahoma uh, long enough recognize the familiar hook echo that's always pointed out by the meteorologists, where you see that kind of drop down uh, comma, and that's where our tornado is going to be at. Uh, that's also where we have uh, a lack of data. So we'd like to be able to get measures within measurements within this particular region to get a better understanding of how that flow moving into the tornado is providing the energy to sustain um, its, uh, its existence. Um, the, one of the big questions that we have as a tornado forms is why does one tornado strengthen when another tornado decides to all of a sudden dissipate? Tornadoes, by their nature, have a very short lifespan. Having the ability to predict that, of course, is going to give us a much better idea of the, um, the behavior and also be able to report those uh, back to people on the ground in order to provide them uh, accurate situational um, awareness. Um, so this then gives us a sense of where we need to be when we start you know, developing capabilities to provide aerial assets uh, closer to the ground, but also removed far enough away so we're no longer risking the lives of storm chasers as we're moving towards a tornado uh, to be able to take these observations. So that finally brings us then to development of some of these UAVs. I'm going to give a couple of examples and then from some of our partners also show some examples of uh, uh, recent encounters. So the first one that we developed uh, was developed by a PhD student of ours called Alyssa uh, Avery, who recently just graduated their PhD uh, and has remained on at OSU to continue working on the project. Uh, and Dr. Avery uh, named this aircraft MARIA for Mesocyclone Analysis Research Investigation Aircraft. Having a good acronym is always very, very important uh, for, your, for your project. But the idea behind this aircraft is actually not to fly into a tornado, but provide a capability to take measurements in front and around the storm as the storm is actually developing. So as you have a convection initiation event where you have a supercell with the capability starting to um, uh, you know, provide tornado genesis, then you can fly Maria into the storm as it, instead of like a weather balloon, you know, sends a radio sonde up into the atmosphere, you can now take those same measurements by dropping it down into the atmosphere and doing this multiple times uh, under command. So this aircraft uh, was developed over a couple of years and is essentially um, you know, kind of our next step into you know, developing this, uh, this capability. Uh, another aircraft that was developed uh, by one of our master students, Levi Ross, and this was actually built around one of our senior design uh, projects, uh, Speedfest, so we used that initial project as the seed for this aircraft. So we modified that initial design, giving it the capability to fly much closer to a tornado. And we call this a tornado intercept aircraft. Uh, so made out of primarily uh, Kevlar, the same type of material that you have in a bulletproof vest. But now instead of using propellers like Maria did, it actually has a jet engine, which allows it to fly faster and its delta weed configuration gives it the capability to encounter things that, that you would um, see in a tornado situation, such as extremely high winds and gusts. 
So the concept of operations by this is you carry this with you on your storm chasing vehicle. As you start to have the potential tornado develop, you launch this from your car, flies you know, in and around the tornado, provides data, and then comes back and lands and you extract that data directly from uh, the aircraft. So here's an example of a TIA on one of its missions flying around and you'll notice that it has a really unique kind of what we call a deep stall landing capability where rather than having to come in and land like you would a runway, it essentially is able to land on the wing um, and essentially pervert, uh, perform a horizontal um, stall and then vertical drop maneuver within a very short distance. So it allows that vehicle to come back to the operators rather than the operators uh, needing to fly, uh, find a place for the vehicle uh, to land. So these car launch capabilities have been demonstrated with a number of our vehicles. So you'll see an example of this here from one of our tests last year, uh, launching the vehicle uh, just off of Highway 51. And so this primarily provides the storm chasers now with the standoff distance so they don't have to get nearly as close to the storm. So hopefully saving the lives of storm chasers. So I'm going to provide an example from um, one of our uh, partners. So this was a uh, supercell gust front uh, intercept. Whoops, here. Give me a second as I, oh, there we go. So what you'll notice is they're launching into uh, relatively calm winds. And so this is the, uh, the University of Colorado group. Uh, so this is on the Colorado Plains, uh, well east of Denver. Um, relatively nice day, but there's a front moving through uh, at the same time. And this shows both the requirements, you know, kind of a, you get a feel for how we're operating these aircraft uh, when we're out in the field. Um, so there is a large logistical requirement of being, it's not just a matter of taking the aircraft out and you're good to go. Uh, it does require a substantial uh, number of people to be able to support this activity. Uh, but you'll see off to the west here, this uh, approaching gust front. Now, as this gust starts to get closer, you'll notice there are multiple vehicles flying around, uh, taking measurements. And these, in this particular case, rather than being custom vehicles like the ones that we showed previously, we're just off the shelf, you know, uh, foamy vehicles that you could essentially find um, online, um, bought and then equipped with uh, some basic uh, sensors. Now, as this front starts to pass through, what you'll see is the vehicles actually start to move backwards, no longer having enough forward velocity to actually overcome the velocity that you're getting uh, from the gust as it passes through. So this, those two things, one, it, it does demonstrate the data that we're getting off of the system, but also the limitations of the capability um, from uh, off-the-shelf systems. And of course, you always can't uh, pass up a really good time-lapse photo of uh, this developing. Weather always looks a lot more interesting when you condense it in a very small amount of time. Now this was uh, also part of the, uh, uh, the Vortex 2 campaign, and so you'll notice the radar system that they had here, and part of it was being able to compare radar measurements with airborne measurements and do a comparison between the two capabilities. And you'll notice the temperature dropping here over time, and you can see that sharp shock that you get as that gust front passes through, dropping the temperature dramatically as that wind also accompanies it. And overlaid on top of this, you'll see the location of the aircraft and their inability to move forward within that actual gust front. So this actually led us to the requirement to divide, uh, design you know, some of these aircraft uh, that have these, uh, these greater capabilities associated with them. Um, so more recently last year, as part of the TORUS project, uh, which was a National Science Foundation funded project for the National Robotics Initiative, um, these are our colleagues at the uh, University of Nebraska. Uh, again, you know, uh, taking measurements within a developing thunderstorm, not a tornado yet, 
uh, but demonstrating the capability as this you know, supercell is developing, um, the ability to go through and actually go through the process of uh, taking and acquiring measurements. And we'll take a quick look at uh, an example of what a um, typical storm chase looks like as part of this process, uh, which we do have uh, our local meteorologist here um, on staff at um, uh, OSU, Andy Wallace, who's actually in the PR department, but was a uh, previous meteorologist uh, for uh, the Tulsa area. Uh, still takes off a number of days uh, within the, uh, the spring storm season and also provides us lots of really good advice uh, when we get prepped to go out to the field. So that finally brings us to what we're going to be doing now. Uh, so in addition to the aircraft that we have developed, one of the things that we're doing new this year is the development of what are called solar balloons. So one of the limitations that we have with UAVs is we are restricted by what we're allowed to do with the Federal Aviation Administration. Even though we have relatively large areas that we can operate in, uh, we are restricted to what's called visual line of sight. We have to be able to see the aircraft. So that still means we have to get very close to the storm to be able to operate the aircraft to get the data back. So also, you know, also then potentially um, you know, putting risk of harm to the, uh, to the team that's uh, operating the aircraft. Uh, so to help augment this capability, so we partnered with NASA JPL and Sandia National Laboratories uh, to launch what are called solar balloons into these storms. So we're currently in the process of having our undergraduate and graduate student team manufacture these, so that way we can fly these into the developing storm system, essentially floating along with the air currents, rising along with the storm up to potentially 40,000 feet, simultaneously taking measurements of pressure, temperature, humidity, and providing that information directly back to the storm team. This is essentially a precursor of the future to come. So where we envision things to be at some point in the very near future is a combination of these capabilities where you have an unmanned aircraft flying ahead of, in, and around a storm at the same time releasing dozens or hundreds of miniature sensors going back to the Twister movie, but rather than having Dorothy sit in front of the storm plopped out you know, on the side of the road by you know, Ford pickup. Instead, now you're using an unmanned aircraft to release these where you think they're going to be most valuable by providing that information directly back to the storm and that information then going back to the meteorologist to improve our forecasting and modeling capabilities. So I, as I mentioned, we had a relatively large team associated with this with a number of PIs. Uh, and quite literally dozens of graduate and undergraduate students uh, working on this project. Uh, the people listed here are only a small group of those that have been working on this. We're now in the process of taking this forward uh, through other grants through NSF and hopefully through additional support uh, from you know, future grants from uh, NASA and NOAA. And so with that, I'd be happy to take any questions if there are any. Thanks for your time. Right, so, so we were actually in the process of developing autonomous path planning capabilities. So rather than a system like this being piloted by a pilot on the ground, now you have the artificial intelligence with machine learning algorithms on the autopilot determining where it should go next based upon not only readings that it's taking in the air, but also information that it's getting from 
radar data, whether that's on board or additional radar data on the ground as well, so it can determine where it's most advantageous for it to go. So that's currently one of the parts of this greater puzzle that we're working on. Yes? Yeah, yeah th there are, and we actually have one of the few uh, beyond visual line of sight, uh, what are called COAs or approvals from the FAA uh, to essentially test the waters, as it were. You know, the, the FAA really wants more data on the risk uh, involved, so that way when you eventually do fly a Monday, an unmanned aircraft beyond visual line of sight, um, they'll know what those risks are and that way they can mitigate around them. Uh, so we have a corridor east of Stillwater that flies from our flight field up to about 12 miles, I think, eight, sorry, yeah, 12 to 18 miles north of that, uh, which provides us limited capabilities to test beyond visual line of sight technologies, uh, report that information back to the FAA, and then hopefully, you know, develop those capabilities uh, over a number of years. We're also working with uh, partners at the FAA, a lot of commercial partners, um, and the Choctaw Nation uh, has a what's called a integrated pilot program test site uh, down near, near uh, Daisy, Oklahoma, which gives us essentially some breathing room uh, to test some of these new technologies as well. So that will happen, whether that happens in two years or whether that happens in 10 years, it's hard to say, because uh, the FAA is obviously very concerned about the safety of the airspace and wanting to make sure they maintain that first and foremost. But it will happen, particularly as technology and sensors improve. Would you like to say anything about the potential of a three-dimensional mesonet while you're working on it? Yeah, I don't know if I included any slides. Actually, I did. So I think I have one slide in here uh, on this. As I mentioned earlier in the presentation, you know, um, Oklahoma is really fortunate to have the, uh, the Oklahoma Mesonet, and uh, you know, Dr. Carlson has been involved in that for a number of years in developing the capabilities for uh, improved fire predictions based upon the data coming off of the Mesonet. One of the things that we've been working on collaboratively between uh, OSU, OU, and the, the Mesonet team is the potential to develop what we call the 3D Mesonet. Rather than taking measurements uh, on the ground, and we do have a vertical capability within the mesonet, but it's located 10 meters off the ground, we'd like to take that 1,000 meters or 3,000 feet uh, into the air at least to provide us an on-demand capability. So that way, when the National Weather Service, for example, says, "Hey, you know, this seems like a, a likely day to develop severe storms." we would like more information to put into our forecast models so we can provide better predictability as part of that. So this is one of our long-term efforts and collaborative goals between the teams is to develop this capability. There's a lot of pieces of this puzzle, not only developing uh, the aircraft and the sensors and what kind of data that you need, uh, detect and avoid capabilities which go back into the beyond visual line of sight because we don't want to have people stationed around with every mesonet, but there are a lot of other questions we have to answer as part of this. How many do we need? Do we need a, a drone at every mesonet tower um, or every tenth mesonet tower? Or do we need more than that and provide a greater density of uh, measurements across the state? And we really don't know the answer to that question. Um, some of our colleagues have run simulations already to show that even if we just get the capability to fly drones to 400 feet, that's already a remarkably, a demonstrably better forecast capability if we take that data and put that directly into our uh, forecasting models. But I didn't pay JD to ask, ask that question, so, but I appreciate it. Yes? Yeah, that's actually an excellent question, and I don't think I uh, seeded any uh, slides in my presentation to, 
to answer that one. I'll, actually, I do have one in here. Um, this provides an example, first off, of what we see when we uh, put a drone into the air. What you're seeing on the left-hand side of the plots, and, and so this is another plot, I apologize. I'm throwing another, more, more plots in the, uh, the presentation. Uh, but this is time on the x-axis, height on the y-axis, and our colors are temperature on the top and humidity on the bottom. And so this allows you to visualize what's happening in the boundary layer as the sun comes out in the morning, starts to heat the ground up, and essentially that boundary layer grows and gets bigger over time. So you can see this warm air move away from the ground, essentially move up into the atmosphere, and that's what's providing a lot of the energy for these storms to form. So this is the great thing, right? We've never been able to see this before. So you know, the drones within the last five years have provided this capability to provide this picture that you know, in previous decades we've never had the capability to see. But what we also notice is when we take this up, we'll see there are four sensors on this particular platform. Uh, as we send it up, it reads different data on the way down. Uh, and this was our first indication. This was the first year as part of our NSF cloud map project. Uh, we saw this and we said, huh, we didn't expect to see that. And uh, three degrees Celsius doesn't sound like a lot, but it makes a huge difference when you're putting that information into the forecasting models. We really need to have accuracy around 0.2 degrees uh, Celsius or so to be able to feed that in accurately and really have a good idea what's going on. Um, so what you'll notice, and so what we later learned, is that integration into the platforms is really tricky, but also very, very key. And this is a CFD simulation over uh, a common drone that, you know, um, is essentially the ubiquitous drone that most people operate uh, you know, to get pretty aerial pictures. And you can see the very complex nature of the flow over this, and these actually become more difficult to predict than what you would have a, a much larger scale aircraft. So you have a very uh, finicky problem of trying to integrate these sensors into the platform and make sure that what you're seeing is accurate, uh, that data is correct. So the part, the portion of calibrating the sensors as they go into the vehicle and then validating the measurements that you're getting uh, off of the system are accurate is a really important step of the process. And we spent a lot of time both at the Mesonet Towers doing this calibration and validation process, as well as using the, uh, the Department of Energy's ARM site uh, in the northern part of the state. All right, I think that will probably end it for now, unless there are any other questions. I'll be happy to hang out for a few minutes in case you would uh, like to ask those in person. Thanks again. So have a safe tornado season out there this spring. Thank you.